Good morning, I'm Deeksha Sharma. I'm a DPhil candidate here at the University of Oxford at the law faculty. I'm also the coordinator for the Middle East rounds of the Price Media Law Moot Court competition. Today I'll be speaking to you about some of the key aspects of mooting, uh, which are research, drafting and oral presentation. And just a few caveats, this is a very basic presentation. It just gives you some an insight into what this mooting process is all about, what does it include. For more detailed videos, we have videos on research, on use of uh, citations, the Oscola format, uh, the, 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 style, uh, the Oscola style guide for citations, and we have videos on uh, oral presentation up on our website. Uh, so for more detailed videos, uh, you are very welcome to go to them. This is just a very basic insight into the key aspects of mooting. So to start with the first one, research. When you, what do you do when you get a moot court problem? Well, the first thing I, I would suggest is that you go through the facts very carefully. Read the problem, reread the problem, reread till the extent, till the time you're actually able to separate the key facts from some of the not so important facts. Because every moot court problem would have some facts which are absolutely the core key facts, uh, very relevant to the, to the legal questions. And some of them would obviously be creating the sort of setting in which the moot court problem is, is, is drafted. When you have this kind of a grasp over the facts, then your job is then to look for any similar incidents or similar developments that have taken place anywhere uh, around the world. Is there any court case pending somewhere with, with similar set of facts? Uh, this will help you understand what is it that the moot court problem actually is getting at. What are the kind of uh, policy issues, besides the legal questions obviously given in the moot court problem, what are the other uh, policy issues that it wants you to pick up and focus on? And, and, and it'll help you identify the broader policy debate. After, after that, as you can also see, uh, see in Catherine Jackson's video, which is there on our website, your job would be to start approaching uh, the primary material, the primary sources which are relevant to your moot court problem. Uh, well, after that, you know, obviously you will go back to this, uh, you will go to the secondary sources after that, uh, but the, the trick for you lies in understanding what authoritative value which of these resources have for you, and thus, how can they actually strengthen your argument, and how can they actually support you uh, in making your argument. A key thing about this moot court is referring to judicial decisions or laws from other countries. Now, you are arguing your case in this moot court in the Universal Freedom of Expression Court. As per the rules of the competition, you are allowed uh, to refer to material from various jurisdictions across the globe. Now, that can be a tricky task because you not only have to just know the decision and the facts on which it was based, but you also have to understand the jurisprudence of that court, wh what relevance did it have in that country's, uh, you know, in, in the legal developments in that country, or how does it really apply to your case? Uh, you have to understand all of that before you actually uh, use judicial decisions from other countries. Now, this is, th this is basically your part before you actually start putting something on, on paper. Once you're done with these steps, the, these basic steps of research, uh, you come down to starting to draft your memorial. Now, what are the key things here? The first key thing here is to understand what are the parts of the memorial. Now, the rules of the competition clearly state what parts a memorial should have. Make sure you're thorough with the rules and you understand what all specific parts your memorial for this competition must contain. After that, when you've understood the parts, you come down to drafting the substantive arguments. Here again, I spoke to you about the relevance of primary sources and secondary sources. So when you're drafting your argument, make sure which source, can, which, which authority uh, can actually support your case better or makes your case stronger and, and use them in that order. Similarly, it is important that you, you do not just go on citing the law, but you also integrate the law with the facts of your case. No memorial which goes on for five pages just giving out the law without, any, uh, without giving any context of why you're citing it uh, is, is a good read for the, for the people who mark the memorial. So make sure that you, you're using good law, but at the same time, you're integrating it well with the facts of your case. 
Remember to follow when, when you're drafting your memorials and putting down your citations, remember to follow the Ascola style guide. As I said, there is a detailed video on some of the nuances of Ascola, that, which, which, is, uh, which was done by Sandra Meredith and which is up on our website. Uh, so if you're new to Ascola, do refer to that video, uh, video for giving you uh, an insight into this style guide. After that, make sure you've checked the memorial for, for any penalty points that you might lose because of using or not using the style guide in a particular manner. So make sure you actually understand uh, the penalties aspects of the competition uh, really well. This also includes the format in which you must submit your memorial. Now, make sure after drafting your memorial, you've had ample time for actually polishing and proofreading it. Some, we all, as mooters, we understand that you know, there's immense pressure, you are new to that area of law, and uh, you know, you, you're almost, there's this temptation to write and draft till the last day just before you press that send uh, button, but absolutely avoid it. Try at least, at least a week before you, you must try to get over with the drafting of the memorial and then make sure different members of your team, your coaches uh, have read it and have polished it and looked at it for errors, uh, errors, any substantive errors and also any errors where you might lose penalty points. And here the role of a coach becomes very important. During the research stage, it is expected of all good coaches to guide uh, their team uh, through, through, the through the use of the material, point them out to the right sources, uh, challenge their use uh, of uh, legal authorities, make them think about why they are using that legal authority, what relevance does it have to the facts of the case, and, 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 and ask them to look out for more primary and secondary sources to support their case. Now that's the role during the research stage. During the drafting stage, no moot court competition would want or expect or want the coach to actually draft the memorial. But definitely the coach can point out in the direction of drafting the memorial in the right manner, which, which means obviously uh, the way in which you present your arguments in the memorial, but also uh, uh, look out for penalties and other points which actually, uh, or other aspects which actually may, may make a, a person checking the memorial uh, give that memorial, mark that memorial uh, not very high because of certain reasons. It's the role of the coach to look out for these fine things in the drafting uh, of the memorial. Uh, another thing that's key in the drafting of the memorial is you obviously have many arguments in the memorial, and this is something your coach can also assist you with. You obviously have many arguments. Some of them are your key arguments, and some of them are your sub-arguments or your alternative arguments. Make sure they all are presented in a very clear, comprehensive manner, where it, it, it is very clearly laid out what is your main argument and why and how you would come down to the sub-argument. Obviously, do not spend too much time on the sub-argument. At, at the stage of drafting the memorial, you want to make sure that everything you want to say in your oral rounds is there in, in your memorial. But at the same time, you do not want to reveal all your cards uh, for the oral presentation. So, as per the rules of the competition, you cannot bring in uh, the use of new material just in the oral round. So make sure you have what you, uh, unless it's a new development after the submission of the memorials. Uh, so make sure you at least have something about your, you know, sort of brownie arguments that you think which will get you brownie points. So you have something there about them in your memorial, but perhaps not in as much detail uh, so as to give your opponents uh, a chance to come back and rebut it strongly or, 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 or you know, perhaps you want to make greater use of it during your oral rounds uh, uh, to make the arguments more interesting. So make sure you sort of have that fine balance and here again the role of the coaches becomes very important to guide the students through uh, the organization of their arguments in the memorial. After that, you come to preparing for your oral presentation. Now you've, you've researched, you've sent the memorial, the me your memorials are with us, and now it's time, uh, it's, it's, it's the time between you, you, you coming uh, here for your oral presentations or for the oral runs of the competition. What is, what is it that you, that you must bear in mind? Well, the first thing obviously is to go back to your memorial and read it carefully. Understand what is the case you are making, which, which obviously you, quite, you understand quite well up till that stage anyways. But still, go back to your memorial, understand what you've done there, and after that, prepare a blueprint or a skeleton structure of your key arguments. 
the whole idea of this blueprint or a skeleton structure is to make sure that when you're before the court, you have, you, you have put out all the points that you think are key or are necessary uh, to win, f f that you think are necessary to win a particular argument or, or, uh, uh, or, or you think are, are, are key to, to your argument. After that, make sure that while preparing for your oral presentation, make sure all your papers are flagged up very carefully. If you are going to refer to papers or certain page numbers in your memorial, make sure you have actually flagged them up very carefully. And in your skeleton structure, you exactly know which point to go to for, for citing or for making, uh, uh, making a particular reference. Uh, this is helpful because obviously you don't want to come across as a speaker who's fiddling uh, with papers on, 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 uh, while, while making their argument, which is quite distracting for, for the people, for the judges. But anyways, it's also, it would also uh, consume your time and make you uncomfortable. Uh, I, another thing that you must have with you is a key, is a summary of key authorities of the facts of that, uh, key authorities uh, that you've used in your memorial. Now, by this I mean uh, the, the, what was said, say, say a judicial decision, what was said in that particular judicial decision, which was the court, who were the judges, who delivered, who's delivered the majority, like, who were in majority, who were in minority. Uh, so all these things have a very ready reference uh, of these key um, authorities uh, so that if when you're using them in your oral arguments and, and, the, and a judge questions you, uh, 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 questions you, uh, asks you for the details of a particular authority, you're able to cite them comfortably uh, without losing any time, without actually being put off the course of your arguments uh, because of having to look for, having to remember uh, the details of a particular authority. Then again, have a ready reference of the facts of that case. If the key facts that you're citing, make sure you have a a uh, sheet of paper on which you have noted down all those key facts along with the paragraphs in the moot court problem where they have been given. So uh, a ready reference of the key authorities that you're relying on and a ready reference of the facts of the case. Now, presenting your arguments, when you actually come here and the day comes when you have to present your arguments, what is the order of the court proceedings? Uh, you must understand that. While commencing your arguments, you must, uh, when you say, may it please the Honorable Court, you must not disclose your, the name of your institution. You, well, as, at least as the first speaker for the applicant, you should ask the court uh, if, if your excellencies want a brief summary of the facts of the case, well, but, but, but make sure that A, it is a brief summary, and B, that in case you, you are, if the in most, well, in a lot of cases, the judges might just tell you to actually move on because they're aware of the facts of the case. Uh, then in that case, be prepared to start your arguments, uh, to start right from your arguments without giving these facts of the case. So don't rehearse one certain set pattern uh, to the extent that you're not able to move to anything else comfortably. Uh, when as you start out as the first speaker, make sure you give, uh, give out the structure of your team's argument. What, will you be, what issues you as, as speaker one would be dealing with and what issues uh, your co-counsel uh, would be dealing with. After that, present a brief outline of your own arguments as to how will you go on establishing uh, your case on a particular issue. This uh, flags up your case, this sort of uh, actually points the judges in this sort of assists the judges uh, in a way that they know that what is going to come ahead. So they are with you, they are, they are uh, with you as you go through your arguments. Now, uh, when you're making your arguments, as you have in your memorial, there are some main arguments and there are some sub arguments. Now it is as, 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 as a mooter, you have to very carefully and strategically use your arguments. For instance, if a judge uh, is satisfied on a particular issue or asks you to move on after you've given your main argument, then, well, it makes no sense to actually go back to your memorial or go back to your skeleton structure uh, and, and, and start citing the sub-arguments. Also, sometimes during the questions uh, put by the judges or put by the bench, uh, you will realize that some of the arguments which you had to make as your sub-arguments have already been made while answering them. Then again, it does not make any sense to go back to them. 
well, and uh, therefore you must continue, you must go to the next issue. Uh, you, you can also, uh, when you're making your arguments, you can also refer to the arguments of your opponents uh, and, and, make your, and, and use your sub-arguments or your main argument and, uh, 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 to, to uh, sort of reply to their, to their arguments or give a point in relation to them. But then again, you must be very careful that you actually don't just end up uh, uh, on an exercise of breaking the other, other team's case. You must be able to present your own case besides actually comfortably uh, defeating theirs. So it's, 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 it's a great question of time management and strategy here. Again, when you make your oral presentations, make sure you are integrating the law with the facts of your case. As you go through your arguments, keep signposting for, for the bench uh, what you have established till now and what part of your argument you're on. This helps the bench to be with you, uh, and that's really the key. Uh, try ending each argument of yours with a brief summary of what you have already uh, said in that argument and how, that, how through your arguments you've shown that the issue should be decided in your favor. After you finish your argument on a particular issue, never ask the judges if they're satisfied with it. Well, they, 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 they might be satisfied, they might not be. They, would, they might want to tell that to you that time, they might not. It's just important that you ask them if you can move on to your next argument without the question of satisfaction being put to them at that point of time. Uh, so so it's, it's always good to probably ask them, if your excellencies permit, may I now move on to my next argument or hand over the floor to my co-counsel. Now, when you actually go in a go for your oral presentations, you must understand that this whole exercise is a two-way process. It is not a place where you draft up a speech, you come and deliver it. It is essentially uh, you trying to help the court uh, and trying to convince the court as to why this case should be decided in your favor. And in that process, you will realize that you can meet two types of benches, a hot bench or a cold bench. Now, hot benches, as we say, are the ones who would be very active in uh, putting up questions, uh, whereas cold benches might, might, want, might be people who might want to listen to you for, for, for some time before actually putting one or two questions to you. Both the benches have their own merits, but it is important for you. The, the key really is how you uh, perform in front of them or how you react to those benches. For instance, if you think that there, if you, if you think you've met a hot bench and they are putting up many questions, some of which are extremely relevant to your argument, and in, in the course of answering those questions, you've already answered uh, or you've already made uh, some of your key points, then make sure you don't repeat them. You just move on to the next argument if you, if you think and get a sense from the court that the court is convinced on a particular issue or a particular argument. Uh, similarly, when you meet a cold bench and you see that, you know, there is no, that there are that no question, you know, you, 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 it's 10 minutes down the line, you're left with just five or six minutes, there have been no questions till now, then it's again your duty as a counsel to, to, to uh, or as a mooter to generate interest. Now in that case, what can you do? Perhaps you can ask the court uh, or the bench, uh, perhaps you can ask the bench to actually refer to some page in your memorial or you can, uh, uh, you know, you can point out to your opponent's arguments at that point of time to just make your arguments a little more interesting and, and uh, give it more a feel of a real courtroom. In, if it both the benches, eye contact is important. It's, it's important that you keep understanding where they're going, what, what, they're, what, they're, what they're really seeking, whether they actually have interest, uh, how much interest has, has your argument managed to generate. And for that reason, eye contact with the bench is very important. Similarly, pacing of your argument is very important. You don't want to go too fast so as to lose the bench, and also you don't want to be too slow because you only have a certain time uh, to present your argument. Similarly, tone and style, and as I said, referring to your opponent's arguments. Uh, some, of, some of these uh, key aspects, rather most of these key aspects, have been discussed in Nick Friedman's video on our website. Uh, so for more details and for, for, uh, for, for a more comprehensive analysis of uh, your, uh, key tips for oral presentation, uh, you must go uh, to, those, to those two videos by Nick Friedman. Moving on to, uh, as I said, a hot bench, 
which is something I'll deal with specifically because some of the mo many mooters complain that they find it difficult, or at least mooters starting out complain that they find it difficult to get back to their uh, arguments uh, 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 when too many questions are put to them. In this scenario, I must point out that the relevance of your blueprint or your skeleton structure comes in. As you're seeing, as I said before, as you're seeing that some of the points that you've already, that you wanted to address have been dealt with through uh, the questions that you've answered for the judges, make sure you move on. Also understand that a hot bench actually might be asking you more questions, not to make you uncomfortable, but they might be testing uh, particular mooting skills. Every time a judge wants to ask you a question, every time it looks to you that a judge wants to ask you a question, pay due respect and stop wherever you are and let the judge ask their question. Do not ever try to speak over a judge. No matter how comfortable you're getting, it is your duty to maintain your calm and composure. It is your duty to not show uh, to the bench that you are angry or upset in any manner. Even in terms of styles of mooting, there is a difference between being persuasive and being aggressive. So whenever, so even if you meet a hot bench and uh, you know you you put in uh, you you put under difficult circumstances which you have not faced before, then make then remember that it will be your composure that will get you out of them and that will actually uh, treat it like an interaction with the judges where you're helping them understand a particular issue, helping them understand a particular point and, 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 and treat it as a process uh, which will in the end be enriching for both you and the bench. You should treat your arguments as if you're telling a story and you, must, you should treat uh, the, the questions of the judges as actually facilitators uh, uh, in getting out the be in getting the best points of your story out uh, and, and actually making it more convincing. If you this approach uh, to a hot bench actually might make it an enjoyable process for you to argue before a hot bench. Then again, as I said, don't be too rigid with your speech. Be prepared in case if you're running out of time to drop certain points and that's why you must be aware which are your core arguments or core points which must be made and those which actually can be dropped uh, because perhaps that point has already been established before or perhaps the sub argument is not that relevant anyways. So you must be prepared to actually uh, move on. Right, time management as I said is the key because you, you have to present your case, you have to tell the story, at the same time you have to answer the questions, you have to make sure you've covered all your points, all the good research that you've done in your memorial, uh, you, 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 you want to make sure that you've presented that, you, you want to make sure you've actually made the bench uh, see your memorial by referring to various pages of your memorial while making the argument. Now this is too much to do in a 15 to 20 minute uh, time period, so you must be very careful uh, uh, of your of how your time is actually going uh, and therefore time management becomes the key here. Also something that actually might make your process of answering to the judges questions easier is anticipating those questions. Once you've sent the memorials to us and you're preparing for the oral rounds, this is something you and your, your team and your well, along with your coach can actually sit down and do. Just go through, uh, just rigorously dissect the problem and the legal questions involved, the authorities you've used, and see what are the most first, what are the most obvious questions uh, that might be put up. Uh, then look at the, some of the more, some of the finer, then try and think of some of the finer questions that might be asked uh, based on particular set of facts in the case, particular argument you've drafted, particular authorities you've used, and, and, and make a list of these very important, uh, important maybe sort of uh, ancillary questions uh, categorizing them in, in whichever way you want and have sort of ready answers uh, for them. Also while you're preparing along with your coach uh, as, as, as a team you all should think about have there been any uh, and this is something you did at the stage of research but then again you know you might have missed something so go back to uh, thinking on these lines uh, of whether there has been any real incident or uh, you know any court case uh, pending somewhere which is related to the hypothetical facts given to you or has there been a decision for that matter in a similar case after you've submitted your memorial. Uh, although you, you, you cannot use that to make a new argument as per the rules of the competition but 
you can obviously use that to support an existing argument and, and being aware of the recent developments in the area of law that you're actually arguing your moot court problem in would obviously fetch you brownie points because that shows how interested and how aware uh, and well researched you are as a team. Uh, also think of if there, there, there are any procedural questions beside the legal substantive questions uh, in your moot court problem, think of uh, are there any procedural challenges or procedural questions that can come up in this problem? Well, this is something uh, you, you obviously would have thought of at the, at the research stage itself, at the research and drafting stage itself, but then again, doesn't hurt to go back to these questions again. Also, you must be you must give a thought as a team to the policy implications of your arguments. Uh, sometimes a judge might on the spot ask you to give them an alternative to something or give them a solution or give them uh, a decision that you would be, uh, you know, you would be fine with. In such cases, you must be able to, you know, bring together uh, the case that you've made based on the legal authorities, the facts, and then, uh, and the policy implications of your arguments, of your case, and be able to present the judge uh, and help the judge when such questions are put to you. Now we come to the last part of, uh, of a moot court round, which is rebuttals and surrebuttals. Uh, different people treat their importance in a different way. As a mooter, I've always seen them as a great opportunity to nail it finally. Uh, and that's why make sure you actually enter a rebuttal. Or, well, we'll first talk about the rebuttal because surrebuttal is, de is dependent on the rebuttal. But if you're making the rebuttal, make sure you enter with only maximum three or four key points kept very comprehensive, very crisp, uh, obviously arising from the arguments that your opponents have made uh, and, and showing how your arguments actually defeat uh, those points. So th that is your final opportunity to convince the court as to why they should decide this case in your favor. So the more points you, it's, it's a great temptation as a mooter to, to go enter a rebuttal with uh, seven or 10 points or five or seven points you know, and try and cover all the flaws, all the mistakes uh, in your opponent's case. But that really, uh, according to me, is a questionable strategy and, and it might just be best to uh, enter with just the key points. Make sure that you're calm, you're composed, you don't look overexcited, you look persuasive but not aggressive and absolutely necessary, you're not reading while, while making this rebuttal or surrebuttal. Just a point about reading, this is advocacy. So make sure you actually don't just have a script which you read throughout your round because that's not going to be interesting for anyone there. So make sure that obviously all of us use scripts, all of us uh, uh, refer back to them, but then there is good eye contact with the judge, there is good body language there that you are actually a counsel, assisting them with them, trying to keep them with you uh, while making your arguments. Uh, and, and, and this for me, uh, these are some of the key points that according to me uh, might be helpful uh, for you while you work on, on our moot court problem for this year. Uh, good luck to all of you. And as I said, for more details on some of the points that I have mentioned uh, in my presentation, we have uh, videos by, uh, by Sandra Meredith, Katherine Jackson, and uh, Nick Friedman on our website. Make sure uh, you go and look at them as well. All the very best, thank you.